my fellow friends. Today we have come together with great honor and privilege for the seminar of arbitration organized by the Civil Law Department at Francis Law Talk. In the field of law, arbitration stands as a fundamental aspect playing a significant role in resolving disputes beyond court <coughs> Today we embark on a journey to know more about this intimate world of arbitration and it is with my immense pleasure that I introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Sin Wan Yang. Arbitration and has a PhD in law from Martin Luther University, Hal Wittenberg. She is also a visiting scholar of Columbia Law School, New York, and she is also an associate of Charter Institute for Arbitrators and Asia Pacific Arbitration Institute in Singapore, Beihai International Arbitration Board, and World Arbitration Center in Kunming. She is also a mediator of Haiku International Dispute Resolution Center. International Accredited Professional Mediator of Dispute Resolution and Risk Management Institute and Mainland Hong Kong Joint Mediation Center. We are truly privileged to have Dr. Wang with us today as he imparts her knowledge, experience and passion for law to us. We extend our warmest gratitude towards her for addressing us with her presence in this seminar. Thank you so much Dr. Wang. And furthermore, it is my pleasure to extend uh, my warmest welcome to As Assistant Professor Anish Pastola, sir who has uh, graced us today as a visit presence as a guest in the seminar. And uh, furthermore, it is my pleasure to extend warmest uh, welcome to Assistant Professor Gan Gautam, who is the coordinator of the clinical department. And, <laughs> and uh, also, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Assistant Professor Lakshmi Sakodana, of the Associate Professor Mukesh Tungana, who is coordinator of fifth year. Once again, let us extend our warm welcome to Dr. Wang. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang, um, Ali sir, Gyanu sir, Lakshmi ma'am, and Mukesh sir for uh, being here. And thank you so much, all of you, for being present in this seminar. And I would also like to thank the Physical Law Department and Gakman School of Law for providing us with this uh, opportunity to learn a lot on arbitration. And I'm sure as the program goes on, we will be engaging in a very fruitful discussion and we will be learning a lot from Dr. Wang. And uh, as I leave this podium to Dr. Wang, I would like to request you all to engage in a very fruitful discussion. Ask away any questions that you like. and. Um, Engage in a very constructive discussion today at the end of the seminar. Thank you.
uh, I have been traveling to more than 30 countries in the world. And uh, I was trained most in China, in Germany, and also in the United States. Now I have multiple uh, academic uh, studies with uh, Hong Kong and Macau, as well as with UK. So what is international? And why is international relevant to us here, to us Nepalese students here? Um, when I was in New York, I met some Chinese colleagues and Chinese students who stayed in China all their life and made their way to the United States, made their way to the American dream. And besides the only city in China which have been to and New York, they have been to no place in the world. And they told me, America is the best country in the world. I said, how do you know it? You have been only experienced two countries in your life, and your knowledge is limited to this specific city in China, and this specific city, and a specific lab in New York. How do you know that USA is the best country in the world? And uh, that is one story. Um, what is international is, um, the second story is that people can have very narrow and limited mind. Even they are poor in the most international city. I have been to Paris. You know, there is always like a discrimination chain. We call that discrimination chain. For example, people in Kathmandu may look a little bit down on the people from the villages in Nepal. You know, we have that all over the world. For example, people in the largest city in China, in Shanghai and in Beijing, they think all the other people in the world are villagers. People in Paris think that the other French people are inferior to them. I suppose that kind of uh, disrespect chain exists everywhere. So I was visiting some friends in Beijing. His fa her father is uh, one of the top generals in the army. And he was in Beijing all his lifetime. And uh, they saw that everybody outside Beijing are from villages. But actually, we have different cities and different uh, lifestyles outside Beijing as well. So that morning, I was staying in his, uh, uh, my friend's house with his parents there. We started to have breakfast, and he saw the eggs, and he tried to make a, uh, make a conversation with me, like, Celine, how do you get eggs at home? Do you keep a lot of chickens to provide you with eggs? That was his thinking, that people outside Beijing do not have proper resources for eggs. And I got this very weird conversations everywhere. When I was in Germany, we get also students from Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China. If you are familiar with Chinese politics and the Chinese history that we, some parts of China were half colonized in the history. For example, Hong Kong was half colonized by UK government for 100 years. And we have Macau. Macau was <coughs> colonized by Kota for 200 years. So even the return back to the governance of uh, mainland China, they still keep their jurisdictional independence and lifestyle independence. And I got uh, other fellow students from Hong Kong, they asked me, do you have electricity in the mainland? I said, we don't. We just um, celebrate our harvest of wild pigs every spring festival and dance around the fire. <laughs> of course, I'm I think, of course, a lot of people who we used to think that if we are from a village, if we are from a geographically limited area, we would be have less like perspective of the world. Because I didn't grow up in the top cities. I also grew up in a very small city in China. We have uh, villages outside the small city, and we are a very <coughs> poor region. So when I was very, very young, I was very envious, like, why didn't, why was 
wasn't I born in Beijing? If I wasn't I born in New York? If I was born in New York, maybe I would have a better perspective of the world. I would not have this kind of limitations that I had when I was young. Maybe some of you had this kind of question. Why was I a student of Catman Law School? If I was a student of Harvard and Yale, maybe I would do better. But actually, I think international perspective is not built on major countries and major cities. People can have very narrow land, even they are born in the major cities of the world and grew up in a very prosperous area. But people <coughs> from less advantaged background can still broaden the perspective when they really know the world. When we talk about international, if you have a destination that you want to study and you don't need to worry about the money, we would always seem to say, oh, I want to go to USA, right? I want to go to the top law firms, the top law schools. I want to go to Harvard and Yale. Maybe I will go to Western Europe, I will go to the UK, maybe even Australia. But I don't think any Chinese students will say, one day, if I get the opportunity, I will get a degree from Kesha. Or not any Indian students will think, oh, one day if I get a chance, I really, my dream land will be Malaysia. Why is that? Because we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust our countries, but we believe in white people's world. The world has been shaped by them <coughs> for the past hundred years. And we used to think the best legal education, the best law firms, the best of the best are always belong to the white world. We don't have more understanding into our own world. We think international means USA, international means Western European, but it's not true. When we really look at the map of the world, I think international means Nepal, international means Bangladesh, international means you understand a little bit of India and China. That would be more international. And that will benefit you for the rest of your life because we get out of our narrow mind, not narrow in Nepal or not narrow in New York or in Paris. We really start to open our heart to appreciate this world. Maybe we will go to Africa for a construction project. Maybe one day you will explore North Africa. That would be international. Um, but, but that is only like um, mentality. I'm not talking about in the perspective of law. So why should we be interested in international arbitration? Um, when I if I want to be a lawyer in Nepal, I need to be qualified as a Nepalese lawyer, right? And you know that in different states of USA, they have different bar exams. If you want to practice in Texas, California, New York, and uh, North Carolina, you have to have their state bar exam passed. Carrying a bar from New York doesn't mean that you can practice in California. They have independent, separate state exams, right? If you want to practice in UK and other English law nominative areas, you have to get your UK bar. And that gives us a lot of barriers. But if you practice in international arbitration, you are not limited by that. If you have a case, arbitration case, between an Indian and a US company, <coughs> they can always appoint a Nepalese lawyer represent them, both sides, as long as they have trust in you and you can sell yourself very well. That breaches the boundaries. The second is, will the Nepalese court recognize a Chinese court judgment? Not, no. <laughs> At least it's not mandatory, right? Or will a Chinese court enforce a Nepalese court order? For example, for example, Hypothetically, there is a construction case, there is a Nepalese side inside, a Nepalese party and Chinese party inside. And the Chinese party said, okay, um, the Chinese party lose. And Nepalese court said, 
we want to enforce your properties in China. So they sent the judgment, and they sent the court ruling to this place where the Chinese company have the property. Will the Chinese court 100% enforce the judgment? <coughs> Maybe the Chinese court can. Okay, based on the principle of international conventions, based on the principle of reciprocity. Reciprocity means that if you if you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. That is reciprocity. Okay, if a Nepalese court will enforce our judgment, maybe we will also enforce the Nepalese court judgment. That is not mandatory. But with an arbitration award, we have New York Convention. Are you familiar with New York Convention? Yes, um, I suppose some of you have heard of that. So this is a national commission on recognition of and enforcement of international arbitration awards. We get an arbitration award in Nepal. This arbitration award can be enforced in almost 160 countries all over the world. You can just enforce it. This local court will enforce the Nepalese award as the final, final court judgment as the Supreme Court. So that's very convenient. So international administration can, I would say, break barriers, right? And uh, <coughs> beside of that, you are going to graduate very soon. And you will be facing a very critical question in your life. How can you make money? And how can you make money continuously for 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years? After 20 years, maybe you will have come back to your college to have a student's reunion. Some of you will be very well off, and some of you will be not doing so well. Are you going to be happy with And how do you keep your competition always, always, and always? Because in different life stages, when you're younger, we are 18 to 22, your question, your life question will be your status. Then you graduate, you have more questions in your life, like you want to find a good boyfriend and girlfriend, you want to establish a family later, a little bit later. Maybe you want to pursue your master's and PhDs. Maybe you want to get a good job in a good law firm, or maybe you want to work for the court, right? You will face different challenges all life long. And we have a lot of local competitions. Because look at this room. All of your fellow, all of your peers are your competitors. If there is like one position, in the top law firm in Nepal, and they only offer this one position to you, and all of you should compete with that. And how can you compete with that? But you can ch always change your pass. And you can add yourself with a bypass. How do you broaden your pass? If you are only competing with one person, on one road, and all of you are bombing through this road. It's like 10,000 armies crossing one small bridge. That's going to be dangerous. How can you succeed? Change your path. You don't have to run if you can fly. You don't have to run with your fellow students. Maybe you can compete with some Chinese lawyers. Why not? But how can you do that? You add international experience, international expertise as your bypass. <coughs> Do you know how much does arbitration lawyers make? <laughs> you don't show that, right? <laughs> your professors only teach you good things. I will teach you bad things. <laughs> if you practice in Nepal, in Kathmandu, your price will be determined by the local competition. Is that right? Yes. This is a supply and demand chain. And your price will always be determined by the local companies and your local and your peers. 
If they reduce the price, maybe you have to reduce the price. If they increase the service, maybe you have to increase the service. And that price is a local price. We're from less advantageous regions in this world. Even China is very big and China is developing. We cannot say China is the richest country in the world, especially when we divide that wealth with our 1.5 billion people. And our local price, of course, they are cheaper. They are cheaper than New York price. They are cheaper than London price. They are cheaper than Hong Kong price. They are cheaper than a lot of price. Germany price, Switzerland price, right? If you have the international travels. But if you can put yourself in a competition of international arbitration and international practice, your price will be determined by lawyers in London. Your price will be compared to the other, other lawyers in China and India. They say, wow, this Nepalese lawyer, a Nepalese arbitrator is so professional, and his and her price is only 60% of the New York competitor. I want to choose him and her. <coughs> In international arbitration, we also have this discrimination chain. On the top of the discrimination chain, there are UK lawyers and UK arbitrators because they developed arbitration law. They designed the rules. You know, they are the first among the first. When I was working with my UK colleagues, I think they charged around the 500 pounds to 1,200 pounds per hour. That's the top of the discrimination chain. Then after them are uh, Western European lawyers. Lawyers from Switzerland, lawyers from Germany. They are also doing okay. As arbitration, international arbitration lawyers, their rate is around uh, 600 to 800 uh, euros per hour. And we also have our arbitration lawyers maybe in New York, $500 per hour. And maybe we have them in China, almost the same rate. How can you make that kind of money in Casper and Blue? Right? It's going to, of course you can make that kind of money here, but with your competitors. Everyone in this room has speak Nepalese. Everyone in this room may practice law in Nepal. But if some of you can practice law in Bangladesh, practice law in India, practice law in China, practice law in the US and UK, you will have less competitors because you change your path. Think broadly. When we know what is international, we can place ourselves on the competition stage of the world, not only in the power of South Asia. You can compete with other Australian, New Zealand lawyers, and you can win because you have very good education here. I see your curriculum and I see your teachers. You are no less than other students in the world. And you can do this. Of course, I think money is only one part of the incentive. It's not only about money. It's also about <coughs> Changing and reshaping the world. When I went abroad 14 years ago, when Germans and other Western Europeans saw an Asian face, they thought I was their cleaning lady. It's not racist, it's their experience. Because in their experience, when they saw an Asian face, they saw they are someone working in the Chinese restaurant, bring them dishes, do their nails, clean their houses. And then one time I was um, flying, I was in a flight to <coughs> Netherlands, and I was sitting next to a Netherlands professor, and he was asking about my occupation. I told him, oh, I'm, I'm pursuing my PhD in Germany. I'm also a lawyer. He said, wow, that's very amazing. I wouldn't expect a Chinese lady to do international arbitration here. He said, why not? You surprise me now, you can surprise the world. And why the world needs us to reshape
situation goes. Because um, I would not call it racism, but there must be certain prejudice. <coughs> I bet that not many Chinese professors have been here, right? And not many of you have been to China. When we don't understand each other, when we have never been to each other's country, we have prejudice. And I can share you a small story, but don't take it too negatively. <laughs> um, I was fly flying with an airline two days ago from Chengdu to Kathmandu, and I was in the business class. So if you're in the business class, the air students are better to you, right? <laughs> so this guy who was serving on the plane, he, he was trying to be nice to me and talk to me. He said, what are you going to do in Kathmandu? I said, oh, I'm a, I was, uh, I'm a guest lecturer at Kathmandu Law School. I want to give the students some lectures there and a visit there and see my friends there. He said, be careful there. <laughs> and uh, I said, be careful what? He said, one of our commercial delegates in Kathmandu always have health problems. And we believe that there must be problem with the water. <coughs> Don't drink the water there. I think, how did you make that conclusion that this problem is from the water? He said, because this guy said he doesn't want to drink Japanese water. He asked each of our flight to, to bring him two cases of mineral waters from China. So all his drinking waters and cooking waters are from China. I think, wow, what a nice Nepalese delegation. <laughs> if you are delegated to Nepal and you don't even respect the water, how can you make that work? But why is this guy doing that? I think he has both narrow mind and certain prejudice. And I told this air stewardess, I said, you are working for an international airline, you must have been traveling to lots of world. He said, yes. I said, when we go abroad, we don't evaluate our foreign friends only by their material wealth. Because material wealth has been changing for the past 500 years. The center of the world has also been changing. But you should really learn to respect people. And they may give you feedback, very rich, spiritual feedback. You should not only think, wow, Switzerland is a rich country. Then they have safe water. <coughs> And in Nepal, people don't have so much wealth as USA. So I am suspicious of everything. I think that is a narrow line, right? But I believe this prejudice exists everywhere. Maybe an Indian colleague will not trust when the Indian company is in an international arbitration case. He will not trust to appoint a Chinese lawyer. Maybe this Indian company will think they don't have to education in China. That happens, right? I would not call that racist, but they don't know. They don't know any good Chinese lawyers. They didn't talk to them. They don't know their experience. How can they trust something they don't understand? And a Chinese company, for example, multinational companies, may have a dispute with a Sri Lanka company. But this Chinese company may not appoint a Nepalese lawyer to represent the case. Because they say, oh, Nepal is a small country. How could they produce good lawyers? But good lawyers are not produced by countries, right? Good lawyers are produced by trainings and practice. Good training, good practice. Keep training and keep practice. So why should we participate more in this international world? We can reshape all this prejudice based on our color of skin, based on our, our gender, based on our nationality. And we keep reshaping that and reshaping that, and we can see more local participants in the world. That's good, because in some international arbitration cases, an arbitrator from UK may have less confidence in the Pakistan company. In international arbitration, you are a continental legal system, right? Nepal is more or less a continental legal system. Whereas in China, we are all continental legal systems. When we go to the court, 
we trust in printed evidences more because we prefer written down evidences. We trust documents and we trust what we see. Do you trust witnesses in your court system? Yes. Do you trust witnesses more than the written documents? No. no. That in uh, English legal system is different. They may trust the witness more because they have a mechanism designed as cross-examination. If you have seen any U.S. legal movies, U.S. legal series, they will question the evidence of their witness until the maybe until the witness breaks down. They will question the expert witness. Sometimes in real case scenario, there could be a witness from Australia and a witness from Pakistan. Who will the English arbitrator believe in more? Maybe the Australian witness. That happens. Because there is certain prejudice in people's mind if they have been, never been to the other part of the world. He said, no, nobody there. For example, I have an association with you already. Maybe one day you will be judges and arbitrators, you will see me in the court <coughs> as a representing lawyer. And you will see another, for example, uh, representative or, or arbitration lawyer from Kenya. Who will you trust more? Me or the Kenyan lawyer? Yes. So we don't call these English arbitrators racist. They don't know you. They don't know any Pakistan their whole life. And they have no idea what they say is these reports on the Western media controlled by certain countries. They give negative portraits every day. You know? Like mainland China don't have electricity every day. And in Pakistan, people don't have enough food. If you don't even have enough food, how can you produce food lawyers? That would be a suspicion. But if we start to participate more and more, and the international world can see us, they will understand, oh, there is a leading a police lawyer or a traitor for us. And maybe I should trust the politics with more. They made this kind of person. So it's a trustworthy country. That's something people will not say, but that's something very deep in our minds. That happens, right? So I think we should have an international mind wherever we are. It shouldn't be limited by the country where they live, because we all belong to this earth. We are part of the world map. You can speak English. You can go to English lectures. One day you can also go to the court with your English and legal skills. You can compete with any other lawyers in this world. And if Nepal's wealth is growing and Nepal has more international projects with other countries, I'm very certain that the Nepalese companies will choose you over a Chinese lawyer for natural confidence, right? So let's have more understanding to this, what is international and what is arbitration. It will provide you personally more competition power as a person and also as a national. It will not only represent you <coughs> as a colleague, maybe you can reshape and change the prejudice of people from for the Western world, the world, South Asia. Maybe your appearance will change the world into the less developed world. Why not? When the country is less developed, it's because of geographical reason. It's because of historical reason. Maybe some countries are just built on oils, right? Like Dubai. They don't have to study, they're naturally wealth. They're naturally wealthy, they have money. That is by pure luck. Or when we are born in Kashmir, we have less geographical advantage, we don't have a port, we cannot do a lot of international trade and commerce, and we don't have a lot of mines. 
But that does, that is luck. That's, that is part of destiny, we accept that. But that does mean that you are less smart. That does mean that you don't understand law. That does mean that you can have good education, good practice, and be an actual lawyer, or a local lawyer, or any other, anything else, actuator, judges, working the government. When we want to participate in international competition, we break barriers here, first in your own head. You are no less than other human beings. If they can do that, you can do that. If you cannot temporarily do that, it's because of some temporary reasons. You can change that circumstances and do that. Especially in our world, in lawyer's world, in professor's world. You shouldn't be limited by that. <coughs> Three years ago, it was my first time to visit Kesman U Law School, and uh, <coughs> Professor Sangrola delivered a speech to us. Uh, I came here with other Asian professors from <coughs> India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, from China, uh, and from Nepal as well. And uh, Professor Sangrola said, when you write your dissertations, do you always cite the white professors? I said, yes, we do cite the white professors. He said, why don't you Chinese professors start to cite a very good Indian professor, a very good Indian academic person? Why don't a professor in Bangladesh say, oh, my point is very good because I cite a Nepalese scholar? And why is the thinking from? Why do we think that? The white people are smarter. The white people have more authority. Who put that in our mind? So, I think we all belong to the post-colonial world. China was also half colonized. And India was colonized, definitely. I think Nepal was also influenced by the colonization. We all belong to this world, so we should have more understandings into ourselves. If a Chinese company doesn't have confidence in a Nepalese lawyer or an Indian arbitrator, how can we expect that from a Western If we don't do that ourselves, if we don't believe in ourselves, how can we get that from the Western world? How can we worship this, this mentality? Okay? So I think Personally, and uh, from the perspective of a country, from our region, from history, we should all participate more in international arbitration. Then we go to the methodology. It's not easy. Because um, in international arbitration, you have to understand the <coughs> concepts and rules. Although you don't need to bar examination and bar requirements in other countries, but you have to understand them. When we apply Swiss law, what do you do? What do they say? They apply initial or apply the law of uh, um, a CISG. I think you are familiar maybe with CISG, with the United Nations uh, other formal documents. But what if this procedure is totally Western? And they will apply English law and other laws. So I think you can find yourself more opportunity to be exposed to uh, the Western mentality, the Western training. Your Nepalese background will definitely be a plus if you become familiar with both English law and Nepalese law. But if you only understand Nepalese law, that will be a restriction in international competition. If you understand Chinese law, Nepalese law, Indian law, then all of them will be a plus. So be open-minded to the legal trainings of other places. Maybe you will have an arbitration conducted in China and conducted in India. If you are more familiar with the local like civil procedure rules, you will have more chances. Um, and that is one part, and uh, I think what is more important is to, uh, for example, participate in, in a Vismut court, 
get more experience by myself and try to find international internship, not only in Nepal, try to go out. And maybe you can travel to Malaysia. I know there are some good internship programs there. Maybe you can travel to China and other parts of the world. Get yourself more ready to understand what is happening. And uh, I'm not talking about knowledge today. <laughs> I'm teaching you the methodology of how to compete in this international world. Um, do you want to know some um, like court hearings <coughs> and procedures and knowledge about international arbitration? Mm -hmm. I can also talk about that. company for example in South Africa and these companies start to do business with each other but deep inside they don't trust each other's national courts that happens right the South, the South African companies think I'm not familiar with Australian law and how can I win in an Australian court as a South African. <coughs> Vice versa, this also happens to the Australian company. They say, we don't understand anything about South African law. And we are suspicious that the national court of South Africa will be more protective of them. That is a natural suspicion, a natural worry. When we study law and when we study economics, we build our equations, our scenarios in a perfect and clean equation. But we live in a real society. Sometimes our imagination is very different from the reality. So what should we do with? Our ideal imagination, our utopian imagination, or the reality? We should deal with the reality. That happens to everything. When you are having a good life here, when you don't have a good life, you deal with the ugly facts that is surrounding you. Maybe you are surrounded by people you are not like. Maybe you are working with someone, but you, are, you don't like that company. Maybe you are working in the government, but you don't really appreciate everything that's happening there. But this is the real world. We are human beings, we are not gods. We, are, we have those are good parts. And we, human, human nature is also dirty. So we accept those. In international practice, it's the same. Companies could play dirty. Countries could play dirty. That happens. Yes, we may be less advantageous when we go to the national court of another country. What do we do? So the Australian company and the South African company said, we don't trust each other, but look at that Singapore arbitration institution. This arbitration institution is independent. It has nothing to do with Australia and has nothing to do with South Africa. Maybe that Singapore arbitration institution could help us to resolve this field independently and fairly. So both of them said that putting their application across that, 
Okay, if this South African company will have any dispute in the future with an Australian company, they will go to Singapore to resolve their dispute. And they don't trust each other's national law. They say, we don't apply Australian law, civil law. We don't apply South American civil law. We prefer to apply for United Nations Convention on International Trade of Goods. We choose an international law. We choose an independent venue. And then each of us can choose our judge. Each, of, each side can choose their own arbitrators. And the two arbitrators maybe can jointly appoint the third arbitrator as the chief arbitrator. So that process could be more independent. This is the idea of international arbitration in the first place. Two companies from different background countries choose a third country's venue or their own venue to settle the dispute amicably and or settle their dispute more fairly and independently. They can choose their own judges, arbitrators. They can choose their own law. They can choose their own process. Like we want to determine the process by our own parties, not by your national courts. And that is an international tradition. With the ever-increasing exchanges of countries in this world, international arbitration become more and more popular. And uh, what is the advantage of international arbitration, despite what I mentioned? Do you know it? I think you are first year law school students, right? What is the advantage of arbitration compared with litigation? Anyone? Party freedom. Party autonomy. Yes, very good. Anything else? Yes, they can choose animal arbitration if they don't like institutional arbitration. Yes, it's, I, I will also categorize that into party autonomy, so you have freedom. What else? Very good. I think it happens to all over the world. The students on the first row are the best students, right? <laughs> We have a joke in China. If we want to separate the areas in the classroom, the front rows are the hard working area. Uh, we call them, um, I will translate that. How do we call the students with very good studies? We call them kings, kings of studies, right? things like that. So the first rows are for the kings and queens of studies. They can come from everything, they're like tanks. They study three times more than average students and get crazy results in the end. And uh, in the end part, vacational area. <laughs> People want to take a vacation. They usually prefer to sit in the later part, so the teachers will not see them. Uh, I forget the other areas, yeah, but very interesting. No worries, I will not give you remarks. Um, a Chinese client of mine got a fraud case in Czech Republic. Um, the people are very poor for many, many years, and they suddenly get money. These startups are very crazy. <laughs> you may have a word in Nepalese language for this kind of people, you know. Um, in the past three decades, China started to be very rich. Uh, before, I think 40 years ago, many Chinese cannot feed themselves. Some Chinese were starved. They didn't have enough food. Then we suddenly have a lot of good policies that opening up, reform, and uh, a lot of people benefited from real estate uh, investment, and they get that money very quick. And they get that money very easy. And they make they become billionaires suddenly. But with billionaires' pocket, they have farmers' land. 
So I'm kind of my, but these, these are my ideal clients because they are going to make mistakes. I like them. If they don't make mistakes, they don't need lawyers, right? If they always make good decisions, they will not end up in troubles. The bigger troubles they make, the more fees they are going to pay. So I don't mind that. And uh, he went to, he traveled to Europe and he met some liars from some fraudulent people. These people told, them, told him that they designed a electrical car and this kind of electrical car will beat Tesla within three months. <clears throat> and he believed in that. He's not a scientist, he doesn't understand anything about electrical car or the batteries. He made an investment contract with them for 50 million euros, just by himself. <clears throat> of course, his money was gone. But, in their dispute resolution clause, they didn't choose arbitration, they chose the single litigation in Czech Republic. In this case, took six years to win. Spent millions of euros on lawyers. The problem is, when justice comes too late, it will be injustice. We need justice very quickly. In Czech Republic, they did a jurisdictional challenge, case of first instance, case of second instance, and they tried to delay the process as much as possible. And they make every single instance into multiple instances. So that took a lot of energy and money and patience. With international arbitration, as you said, time frequently, in national arbitration, there is only one instance. There is no appeal. So people will get the result very quickly and reverse it. In some very big cases, we can resolve this in six months. And in some very complicated cases, maybe one year, two year, uh, that would depend on the complexity of the case itself. So, time for me is also very important. Um, I also told my client, justice is like true love. You heard of it a lot, but you don't really see it. <laughs> <laughs> and justice is like true love. Only those ones who is good money and a lot of patience will win them. So, we have party autonomy, we have time for leap, and the right other advantages of international arbitration, can you think of? Maybe somewhere from the vacational area? <laughs> oh, as I mentioned, the enforcement of the award. Because of our New York Convention, uh, attrition award can be enforced very easily. Two years ago, there was a Sweden arbitration award against the Chinese company. It's a very big award. I think the Chinese company lost uh, 600 million in that award. And many people were worried that maybe Chinese court will protect this company by not enforcing it, but no. Chinese Supreme Court enforced it. Oh, I also did an internship in Chinese Supreme Court because I wanted to study the cases that read my education. So everybody in the Supreme Court is very, very, very busy. These judges, these clerks, they are very skinny. When I went to Chinese Supreme Court and then when I went to the commercial um, Commercial ministry. I had very opposite feelings. The Supreme Court judges were very skinny. They look very loyal and look very justice. But when I went to the commercial ministry at that time, all of them were very fat. <laughs> they ate good and drank good every day. I could see the opposition. So you never know what your bypass what your bypass is. I made a very strong influence in the Supreme Court. 
because I was very strong. When I wanted to drink the bottled water, they have a very large, like a purifying machine, and all the other clerks couldn't get that water down. It's very heavy. I was the only girl who could do that. So all the Supreme Court judges remembered me. <laughs> Even the Chief Justice, he came to the room of all these interns and looked at me. Oh, you, the, the, the one, the strongest one, you come. I said, oh my god, I'm pursuing my PhD in Germany. I'm the top student always. I am that smart. And then I win the competition by good sports. So never underestimate your other skill set. It may be important of you in, in the future. So, okay, come back to the Chinese Supreme Court. Only the Supreme Court in China will decide enforcement of a foreign arbitration award. What does that mean? When the Supreme Court said, yes, it's a good arbitration award, we don't have any valid grant to um, refuse the, the, the recognition and the enforcement. That arbitration award will be enforced in China as a Supreme Court decision, as in many other places. So we don't have to worry too much about the recognition and enforcement. What we want to, because what do we do in this period? What do we want in litigation and arbitration? For us to show our skills, for the judges to get a job, what do we want to get from the Asian arbitration? What? Why people go to arbitration and litigation? What do we want? They want to get money. They want to get the money back. They want to punish the bad guy to compensate them. The core importance is to get the money back. If they can't get their money back, why do they have to pay the arbitrators and lawyers? We provide services. We only provide services. They only pay for the services we, if we can get the money back. If we cannot get the money back, we're nothing. No matter what your degree is, no matter what your skill set you have, no matter how great attorney you are, if you can't get the money back from them. Of course, if you work for universities and arbitrators and judges, that's okay. We don't have to be responsible for the results. But in commercial arbitration, companies, they want to get money. That's the reason they pay for so expensive arbitration fees to get that. Even if we win the case and we lose the money, we will, be, we will have bad reputation. So, Every time when you face a case, you analyze it. What is the possibility of getting the money back? Not winning. Not winning. Winning is not important. If the possibility of getting the money back is high, do it. If the possibility of getting the money back is not high, even if you will wait, refuse it. That will keep your reputation. Because people will say, the company will say, wow, look at that attorney. I paid millions for him or her. And he didn't get any money back from me. Clients don't understand law. They don't understand how hard you worked. They don't understand how much have you paid for, how much have you been through to be in that position to represent them. They don't understand. What they understand is, did you get my money back? So enforcement is very important in both litigation and arbitration. You have to always consider about that. If we can get if we want to get money from a foreign country, it's not easy. But with the mechanism of international arbitration, we are more secure. This is the advantages, the main advantages of international arbitration, I guess you know. Then we'll come back to the dispute. Firstly, we have to consider about the applicable law. If you have studied any private international law, you may understand the choice of law. People can choose 
their own law in nutrition. And that will be divided into three parts. I'm sorry I don't have PowerPoint presentation. I'll try to make some and listen to you later about what I said. The first part is the applicable law to the merits of the dispute. And how do you want to decide where the dispute is made? When the dispute is heard by a Nepalese law and by a Chinese law, that could be different. For example, what is your statutory limit in your power? Like how many years do we have before you, you can go to the court? Otherwise, you waste that uh, right. So there are different uh, statutory limits as for the cases. So, you know, for some cases it's one year, for some cases it's 35 days from the days of knowledge, and so on. For example, let's take one year for example. The statutory limit may be in Nepal is one year. And you go to the court and say, okay, according to Nepalese law, we cannot accept your case anymore. And the statutory limit in China is three years. The statutory limit in UK is six years. So when you are applying different law, that would mean that if your client can get remedy or not. No, not. If the parties can go to the court and that the court or not. That is one part. Then we have applicable law to the arbitration proceedings. When we are talking about enforcement and enforcement, which court should we go to when we want to enforcement, enforce the arbitration award? Because arbitration institutions cannot enforce. Only the national courts have the power to do that. Should people resort to an English court or should people resort to a Chinese and Nepalese court? That will depend on the party's choice. If not, sometimes we have a very simple arbitration clause. When we take a look at the venue, the arbitration seat, that like if they choose to settle the dispute in Kuala Lumpur, we would consider they have accepted to enforce this according to Malaysia law. That is the second part of the choice of law. And then we go to the third part, which is very important, is the law applied to the validity of the arbitration agreement. Can we both go to the court and arbitration in the same dispute? Can we both? No? That's correct. Arbitration and litigation are two divorced couples. You don't need them together. You can only choose one of them. If you are trying to pick side, you can only pick one side. You know, because they already try to kill each other. When you choose arbitration, it means that you exclude the jurisdiction of the court. When you choose litigation, that means that arbitration tribunal will have no jurisdiction. Arbitration leaves on party autonomy. So if there is party autonomy to go arbitrate, it is the essence and the life of inter international arbitration. People don't even choose you. How can you hear cases and compete with the national courts? So sometimes arbitrators Arbitration lawyers spend one or two years to argue about the jurisdiction of the dispute. Um, I can share a case with you, which I recently had.
this case is very interesting. <clears throat> if you don't mind, I take too much time of you. Ten years ago, when I was a lawyer in Germany, I was practicing law when I was in Germany, and we have some very weird colleagues at that time. So some Chinese lawyers abroad get very good training, but some of them are not. Because in the previous generation, when we didn't have so much demanding on Chinese lawyers abroad, we're supposed to understand both Chinese law, UK law, German law, and blah, blah, blah. Some Chinese lawyers made it because they're Chinese. At that time, a lot of Chinese companies, they don't have language skills, and they <clears throat> trust naturally Chinese lawyers more than other lawyers. So some less professional Chinese lawyers still can get the cases. That will also happen to you, you know? Um, at that time, a Chinese lawyer accepted the client, he stood in German, uh, Germany, um, Mr. Ma, Ma Ma Ma, Mr. Ma. Mr. Ma uh, didn't understand the law and he couldn't even go to the court, but he accepted the case anyway. And two weeks ago, before the court opening, he terminated the agreement with the client. He said, oh, I cannot do this. You are going to do this. I'm going to terminate the contract. And the, and the client was very confused and very lost and very scared because of him. Then we took the case. And we won the case just by one court hearing. It was a very easy and simple case. Mr. Ma just rejected the client, which is not ethical, because he was afraid to go to court. That was already many, many years ago, and I almost forget. And two months ago, I get a client consultation. He said, oh, I get a case dispute in Germany, and we have an arbitration clause. But my lawyer told me the arbitration clause was not valid and encouraged me to go to the court in Germany. But the court said they don't have jurisdiction and rejected us. I said, what kind of lawyer would do that? He said, oh, it's a Mr. Ma. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, for 10 years I would still meet you back here. <laughs> lawyer is nervous. Judge is nervous. It's small world. Be careful of what you do. And good, be a good person. Don't get quick money. Sometimes you can make quick money by being a bad person. But that will destroy your life and reputation. We can make money always and always. Let's do it safely and in the long term. Don't make that kind of quick money. That will destroy you in the end. So I got a case from Mr. Mahama. The Chinese company and German company say, when they have this food, they should either resolve it for arbitration in China or go to litigation in Germany. And then in the attachment of the main contract, they say they are going to apply German civil code in German language. So according to if we interpret this clause by German law, the arbitration clause is valid. Because German law UK law allows parties to say, we can either do this and do that. It's okay, they say, oh, this kind of arbitration clause is valid. But in other places of the world, for example, China, when we have this kind of arbitration clause, it's not valid. The national court will have jurisdiction. So how do we interpret this arbitration clause will decide the destiny of the case. So in international arbitration, we have three sets of applicable law. Arbitration validity, the merits of the dispute, and the procedures. We should be careful with each of them. And then we will go to arbitration. Uh, I think one student here mentioned that there is ad hoc arbitration and institutional arbitration. Oh. What is the ad hoc arbitration? Um, institutional arbitration is domestic. It means that you go to a certain institution and they will administer and help you with the case. 
But ad hoc arbitration is wild. We can, for example, if two parties have to speak here, and we want to appoint three professors here from today as the arbitrator, we can just hear the dispute in this classroom and make an arbitration award to maybe enforce it in Sri Lanka. As long as the parties are happy and we think we're given an arbitration after this and we can do that without any institution's administration. Some countries recognize that in institutional arbitration world, some countries don't. You have to help the client decide, or you have to understand the process in that. If we go to a standard institutional arbitration, we are going to appoint our arbitrators. Can you appoint your classmate as your arbitrator? Can you appoint one of your close teachers to be your arbitrator? You don't. Because that could be easily discovered by the opposing attorney. We have an arbitration award, SC arbitration award in Switzerland. The other party, the applicant for the case, and we were presenting the respondents. And we found in Italian news that the opposing lawyer or good friend with the air arbitrator, and they published that on the internet. And we found that very, very old newspaper, and we presented it to Swiss court. We say, this arbitration is not made in a fair basis. The opposing lawyer, and their chosen arbitrator are close friends. They even put that on news. So we don't think this is a fair game. Then the arbitration award was not enforced by the court. So we're supposed to appoint someone who's independent. Maybe we can have some indirect connection to them if we know them in the factory and we pretend we don't know each other so well. And that will help us. Then we go to the arbitration. Either this arbitration will be done in a continental legal style or a US legal style, depending on the arbitrator's preference. Some arbitrators who are trained in the UK or the US, they will prefer a very fierce confrontation, confrontational and US and UK style of argument. You can spend days on questioning the witness to do cross examination of the experts, blah blah blah. Some experts, some arbitrators from Germany, Switzerland, China, and other continental legal systems, they prefer to hear the case based on the written evidences. That depends, because international arbitration could be very flexible. Then, during the arbitration, at least you have interim measures in Nepal, we want to seize the property, drop someone's bank account, to prevent them to transfer the money. <coughs> Can we do that in international arbitration? Yes. 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 Um, in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Uh, for example, a UK court may enforce the interim order by an arbitration tribunal to seize some, someone's bank account. But, the New York Convention only applies to arbitration awards, not arbitration orders. So some countries say, oh, this interim order from this foreign arbitration tribunal to ask me to block a bank account in China does not belong to the New York Convention. So some countries do accept that, some countries don't. China has not enforced any interim measures from international tribunals yet, but some other countries do accept that, so that requires case-by-case -case analysis. Then we get the final word. We go to enforce in the foreign country, and then we get the money back. Um, in Nepalese court, how do you order the court fee and um, attorney's fee? Do the parties bear the arbitration course by themselves, or the losing party will bear that? Normally, it's the party who agreed to bear it. 
and if the parties agree and it's written in the agreement, the losing party might also go. So it depends on the case of this case. Yes. Mm. In Chinese national courts, uh, usually parties have to pay their own expenses. But the arbitration court can ask the losing party to pay for everything. Um, in international arbitration courts, usually the losing party will normally bear 70 to 80 percent of the arbitration court, their own attorney's fee, and the opposing party's attorney's fee. In that arbitration, a very serious, um, complicated arbitration cases in Singapore, for example. One party's attorney's fee could be two million US dollars. Only paying for the attorneys and not a lot for the arbitration court. So if the other party lose, they have to pay their own two million to the lawyers, the other two million to the opposing party's lawyers, and then 17% of the arbitration fee. So that's really something. We have to play this game very carefully. Um, the leading arbitration institutions in Asia, there is Singapore International Arbitration Institution, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, and we have also ICC based in Paris, who is operating all of the world, International Chamber of Commerce. We also have, um, more, for example, a lot of institutions in London, and we have AAA in the US. If you are interested, you can go to their own website. They have a lot of free classes and materials for you to download. And you can have better understanding of what is happening around the world. I think that would be my knowledge part ending. And I will leave the rest of the time to you to ask questions. Do you have any questions? Anything about my experience? How did I make my PhD in Germany? How did I uh, study abroad? Yeah. You can ask anything. Uh, my question would be uh, in terms of arbitration in terms of emerging markets. For example, the in emerging markets. For example, I think it is the same case in China as well. And we just had a recent case in Nepal uh, between a major telecommunications company and the state government. So that is one of the leading cases. Uh, that was decided like a month ago. The full case is yet to be uh, solved. So my question would be, as a young lawyer, how would you recommend us to try to tap in those resources and try to better prepare ourselves for the emerging markets? Thank you. Good question. Um, okay. Thank you. Professor, the case that he was referring to was the one that I just spoke about. Yes. That Nepal hired an American law firm uh, to go to exit. That, that was the case. Yes. Uh, what I was talking about was uh, commercial cases. This case is an uh, investor and state case. <coughs> uh, but it's similar. I'm going to see that other uh, many um, commercial arbitration institutions also administer state investor arbitration. And it's a very good question as a young lawyer, how do you go to this game? Um, I would say first you need to have multiple language skills. Uh, me personally can speak four languages. I can also speak German and I work in English, German, and Chinese, and I do speak a little French. That would be a practice because in uh, in European market, in the European countries are very small and these People who grew, uh, who grew up in Europe are easily exposed to other cultures. So they grow up usually with multi-language skills. And we have to compete with them, but minimum you have to study your English very good. Language is a key. The more keys you have, the more doors you can open. Not only day-to-day -day English, but legal English. You have to refer, refine your English according to the specific laws. Because in each legal system, they have very specific phrases. And also when we learn legal statute, there are even a lot of Latin words. So you should refer to those first your home language, your mother language, English, minimum, and some Latin phrases. 
The second is find more internship opportunities and maybe find some chances to get education abroad. Um, because if you have never really been to a foreign country, it's not easy to make connection to them. For example, I worked in international reference for several years before I went back to China. And you know, in USA and UK, they have a lot of LLM programs. And I do have some colleagues who went, went abroad for one year and finished their LLM studies and come back. And they can only do Chinese cases. Why? When we are talking about competing in the real world, it's not only about knowledge set, it's about practice and uh, resources, especially social resources, human resources, the more connections you can make. If you want to do international cases, you better be familiar with some international colleagues. When you have a joint program with Pakistan, for example, you have to co-work with the Pakistani, Pakistan team. You cannot only work by yourself. If you don't know any good Pakistan lawyer, how can you persuade your client to trust you? And you have to get close to international arbitration institutions, maybe have some court experience abroad, and that will bring you to the real world scenario, like you have to know the people there. For example, if I come to Nepal and I don't know any one of you, I just learn Nepalese language and take some online classes in Nepal. And one day a Chinese company wants me to fight for them in a Nepalese case. Do you think that could work? I don't know anybody here. I don't know the judges here. I don't know where to find the where is the way to the court. I don't know the style of judges. I don't know their preference. I've never co-worked with any colleagues here. That's not going to work. So find yourself some real practical opportunities, internships in nutrition institutions, in the United Nations, in other NGOs, in international law firms. That will definitely help you. You can meet people. And these people will be your treasures. Because in the end, we are relying on persons to resolve our problems. The more people you can connect to, the more values you can create. And the third important thing is to keep learning. I have been in this area for 14 years. I still feel like I just stepped into international arbitration. They are very international, very experienced international arbitrators. They are doing their best in their 50s. I have to work 10 more years to make real good money. The top arbitration lawyers are almost in their 40s and 50s. And the top arbitrators still work in the 70s. So it's going to be a very long game. I would advise you to do very good sport and uh, keep healthy. Don't work too hard. That will destroy your health. We do have a lot of lawyer friends who died in the 40s because of heart attack and too much hard work. Play a longer game. Yeah, I think that would be my general advice for you. I'm quite confused about the enforceability of our why will not for court in an additional one? And also, uh, is there any challenges in enforceability? You as a, uh, an arbitrational arbitrator lawyer, uh, what have you faced in terms of your experience in the enforceability of arbitration? Very good question. Why only court? Can only court enforce an arbitration award? That has something to do with your state independence and has something to do with the power of allocation in each country. If a U.S. arbitration tribunal can easily enforce your property in the power, that will damage your country's independence. Right? From exterior world, that thing is like that. We don't allow foreign courts and foreign arbitration tribunals to directly 
since the promising of our nationals. At least we don't want to do that. But sometimes with the long arm jurisdiction of, uh, of USA, sometimes we can do that. For example, we have a lot of internet um, tra uh, commerce, uh, international uh, trading on the internet, like Alibaba. And the US court can seize the bank account associated to Alibaba directly if there is intellectual property in French. I've handled cases like that. That's very convenient for a country, especially um, developed country, to grow up. You have to keep being independent. You don't let any superpowers to interfere with your own power. And uh, domestically, why do arbitration courts in Nepal cannot enforce arbitration awards? Because arbitration institution is a civil institution. Us, 200 students, 300 students, five professors, we can form an arbitration institution by ourselves. It's civil and independent. But can we go to the bank to seize the property of another company in Nepal? It's not fair. It's written in your constitution what kind of audience, state audience, can do what kind of things. That needs also regulation from the constitution and the people. As an independent civil institution, we cannot, actual institution cannot directly enforce the property. Let's answer the first part of the question. The second part is the enforceability. Um, I'm not quite worried about the New York Convention itself. The thing most influences in, in enforceability, not theoretically, uh, but in real practice, is depending on the enforced party situation, if they have the money. Because companies have independent identity, they cannot always pierce through the veil of the corporate to enforce the money of the shareholders. So if the corporate bank account, there is some money there, we can enforce. But if there is no money there, we cannot just go to the shareholders and enforce their own money. So that's the biggest problem. We have to find out the properties associated to the company. Um, he asked me a question about how to enter the Chinese market. Uh, that's a very good question. I will come that. The Chinese market is hard for them, for our practitioners. Um, first of all, as a foreigner, you cannot get, you cannot pass bar exam in China. Only Chinese can pass bar exams in China. That's a bad news. But I don't advise you to pass bar exam in China. We do have to be so many legal groups in Chinese. I don't think that's practical, but we do have other positions in the law firm for other nationals, such as consultants, and also like um, other type of partners. If you don't need a Chinese lawyer's title, you can also work in the Chinese lawyer's world, because I see a lot of foreign participants, even from Iran, from USA, from UK, from Germany, from um, Spain, from Mexico, and even from Iran, to be part of the partnership with some local law firms. Uh, and I think it, you, it's possible if you can represent as a um, Nepalese represent in China uh, and learn the Chinese. Chinese language would be quite necessary for you. If you can only speak Chinese, English, uh, it's not enough for the market. If you can speak Chinese, I'm helping a Chinese company to do an import and export with Russia. And there is a Russian guy in China who speaks fluent Chinese, and he always win the bid. Because people prefer easy communication. People are lazy. We don't want to provide a good service if we want to win the competition. We make them feel the most comfortable. The laziest choice that we always choose. So you can definitely enter the Chinese legal market and the representative not only in Nepal, but you can also represent as other um, sort of called Himalayan countries. Um, and secondly is to learn some basic Chinese. That will benefit you. My tour guide, I'm going to travel to Bhutan tomorrow. Um, my travel agency in Nepal 
the, the head of China is in power, the Nepalese person speaks very good Chinese. So he wins all these Chinese tourists who come to Nepal compared to other Nepalese travel agencies. So I think language will be quite necessary and from the chance we really can host a joint program with Casper the Law School to for the students here, you will have more opportunities to travel to China and uh, try to good luck. Um, Chinese society is half of the Chinese I feel like are very friendly to foreign guests. But some, as I mentioned, they have some prejudice and narrow mind, but don't mind about that. You will change their opinion. Right, we take one more question if there's any, and then we end the session for today. All right, um, then we end the session. Thank you very much. Firstly, on behalf of everyone, I'd like to extend my deepest gratitude to Dr. Wang. And uh, I'm sure all of us have gotten way too much experiences and insights from you today. And uh, personally, I'd like to thank you for providing us with uh, your insights on decolonizing perspectives in Asia. And also, thank you so much for showing us that we are self-sufficient and we can do very well on our own. Uh, with that, I would like to request uh, Associate Professor Lakshmi Sapatman to extend a word of thanks. Honorable Dr. Kellen Yun Wang, if I spell yes, okay. Associate Professor Mukis Kunyana Sir, Associate Professor Gany Gautam Sir, uh, Head of Clinical Department, Assistant Professor Onis Kastola Sir, Assistant Professor uh, Bipin Suredi Sir, Intern Students of Clinical Department, and beloved student of BALMB Board Members. Uh, Axel speaks louder than the word that you have already seen hearing, listening to professional doctor. So I, on behalf of Kathmandu School of Law, I stand before you with immense gratitude and pleasure as I extend my heartfelt uh, thanks for gracing us with the concepts of arbitration, uh, professional doctor. And uh, in her presentations, I was very, very happy to hear her starting line, what is international? Exactly the decolonization perspective that we teach to our students. What is the concept of international that you are and we have uh, has been demonstrated by her and she has also said to us that the concept, the rhetoric concept of international is not the same. White man theory is not the international concept that we have learned and so many things in our editions you have learned and this is not only learning, uh, it is also uh, the uh, building of the friendship, building of the um, uh, a kind of uh, um, a kind of bridge between the student and the professions you will be having. And if you have any doubts and if you have anything in for the upcoming days also, you can contact to her also, I guess, because she has already shared her email address with me also uh, in our first meeting. So, professor, I would like to again uh, give you a big, big thanks on behalf of Thank you so much, Lucky Man, for your wonderful word of thanks. And uh, now I would like to call Associate Professor Gyanu Gautam Sun here for giving us a clap.
Sterling, uh, Associate Professor Mokassar, Associate Professor uh, Maksimia, uh, Professors Anis Bastola, Bipin Subedi, and all of the students present over here. I believe the session was very much helpful to you. We also have a recording of it, and if you, if the students who are not present in today's class, uh, if they want, wish to look into what did we did do in our seminar, they could visit our website and go to this uh, uh, video also. So it would also be helpful to you in coming days. You can rewind the video and you can see furthermore if you want to see. Uh, this seminar was actually targeted to you uh, for three of the subjects that you have been studying. Uh, the first is uh, the law on dispute settlement where you have to uh, study arbitration. Uh, another subject is contract law where you have to study arbitration and also the business law students who are specialized to study arbitration. So for these three subjects we have designed this course, we have designed this seminar and a long way from China we had our resource person here. Uh, she gave her your experience and her very motivating words to you. I believe that uh, it would help you stand ahead as she has shared to you, like uh, uh, being a woman from a remote area in China, she had that word that she could be an international student, she could be an international personality ahead, and she proved it right by herself, by her experience, and she is here to motivate you to do the same and to not feel guilty about like where we are and where we are from. So hope this uh, we will take it, this into consideration and we will be having this knowledge with us and uh, this experience from our resource person will help us go to save our world by ourselves. As she already said that there is a competition and we have to make our pass by ourselves within this competition. I don't know how you will make your bypass yourself. Uh, we are here to guide, Catherine the School of Law is here to guide you and to make you skillful, to make you knowledgeable. But you have to make your choice by yourself, you have to make your way by yourself and you have to make your way. Uh, having said this, uh, the session comes to an end. Uh, we will be having uh, the regular classes from tomorrow. Thank you.